interactive plenary sessions hosted by Richard Quest, Liam Fitzpatrick, and Peter Simone. And from the talent displayed at tomorrow's tourism competition, I think we can all feel encouraged about the future of our industry. I think the optimism was confirmed by Richard's conclusions at the new realities of travel plenary just this morning. And of course, we've enjoyed the generous hospitality of our hosts, the China National Tourism Administration and the People's Government of Beijing Municipality, and our conference patron, the Beijing Municipal Commission of Tourism Development. You know, we've talked a lot about the future in this past couple of days, and so it seemed appropriate this afternoon to invite one of the world's leading futurists to help us collect our thoughts and plan for the years ahead. For more than 25 years, Ray Hammond has researched, written, and spoken about future trends that will affect society and business. Global warming and the environmental threat continue to be priorities on the world agenda. Ray is one of the few commentators equipped to communicate how these massive challenges will affect our futures. The way we do business, the far-reaching implications socially, economically, and politically. Ray is a visiting lecturer at the Institute for the Future of Humanity, University of Oxford, a visiting lecturer at the London Business School, and a contributing editor to the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory at the University of Maryland, USA. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ray Hammond. Well, good afternoon, and how are you? Have you had a good conference? <laughs> Happy birthday, Pata, and I have been asked to look at the next 60 years. Let me tell you in advance, that is impossible. I can, however, suggest some of the things that may affect the next 20 or 30 years. And for reasons I will explain, it is impossible to look beyond the year 2040, because something very dramatic will happen then. But before I start talking about the big trends that are going to affect your industry in the next couple of decades, I want to make an observation. We have no language for the technological future. When new technology arrives, in the first instance, we lack the right words with which to describe it. I will give you an example. The slide just now asked you to switch to silent your mobile phone. A bit later on, I'm going to return to the subject of mobile and cell phones as an example of us lacking a language for the technological future. But I can give you some quick and easy examples of what I'm referring to. The device that is throwing my image onto that screen and that screen and these screens, when it was first invented in the English language, was called a magic lantern. Now, of course, we call it a projector. We understand what it does. But in the beginning, we could only describe the lantern by its magical properties. The automobile was a horseless carriage. We could only describe this vehicle by what it didn't have. It didn't have any horses. It was a horseless carriage. The locomotive was an iron horse. An aeroplane was a flying machine. 
radio was wireless. You get my drift. And the same thing happens all the way through the development of technology until we arrive at this mobile phone or cell phone or handy, which is the white heat of communication development today. And later on, I will try and explain why we need to find language for this device we call the mobile phone. But before I do, I want to talk about the very big trends that are going to affect all of us in the next 20 to 30 years. Futurists, also sometimes called futurologists, study the trends of the present. That is the job description in order to try and understand how they may interact and play out in the future. And over the last 30 years, I've identified seven big trends, and you will all of, all of you will know these trends, but it's putting them together and seeing how they interplay that proves interesting. The first one is uneven world population explosion. We are in this year, 2011, going to be seven billion people on the planet. The United Nations says that by the year 2030, we will be eight billion, perhaps 8.2, and by the middle of the century, this planet will host between nine and up to 12 billion people. These are United Nations estimates. Now, the good news is that for the foreseeable future, more and more people will want to travel. The question is, where are we going to find the food, the water, and the energy for 50% more people on this planet? Can we feed 9 or 10 billion people? The answer is, we can. We have hardly begun to spread the actual technology of industrial scale farming to parts of the world that are not yet using it. Food appears to be a challenge, but one we can meet. Less easy is the question of water. But I am told that new, low-energy, low-cost desalination techniques are going to ease the problem. But I also think we will likely to see new forms of water pipe distribution services, networks, and water tankers crisscrossing the world. Energy is, of course, another huge question, but one that I'll come on to under another banner in my seven key drivers of the future. Is there anything that could be done to slow world population explosion or to limit population growth? We do know that free contraception is not the answer. Most of this population explosion will come from regions like sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, parts of Middle and Latin America. Very little growth in Europe, very little growth in North America. The one thing that slows the birth rate is female literacy. If you teach young girls and young women how to read, they are empowered and they feel they can say no. There is direct correlation between female literacy and a reduction in birth rate. But I think that whatever actions are taken, we are heading for nine billion people. That is the first key driver of the future. The second key driver of the future 
is climate disease. Now, this is sometimes called global warming. But global warming is a phrase that has a soft and cuddly feel to it. It sounds as if some people will be benefiting. They will be able to grow champagne grapes in Canada. They will be able to grow wheat where the tundra was in Russia. Not all of this is bad. Well, in my view, and in the view of researchers in this topic who know far more than I do, the outlook is bad because what climate disease brings is not warmer weather, but more extreme weather. And if you look at the weather events around the world in the last few years, if you think about the terrible floods in Queensland, Australia, if you think about the terrible floods in Pakistan, if you think about the terrible, terrible weather events in Latin America, none of these individually can be blamed on climate change. It is impossible to say that that event or that event is a direct result of us heating up the atmosphere. What is possible to say is that the increased number of extreme weather events is likely to be the result of the climate change we are making worse. If, magically, we could clap our hands and cease all greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, we still have another 30 years' worth of extreme weather lying in wait for us. And the reason is that there's a 30-year lag in the carbon cycle. And the heat that is now rising out of the oceans to warm the atmosphere, to make the storms worse, to change the pattern of the super uh, structure of the atmosphere, went into the oceans 30 years ago, in the 1970s, 1980s. Since when, we are now emitting four times the amount of greenhouse gases. Now, I know there will be cynics in this room who believe that global warming, climate change, is just the latest scientific fashion, a fad. I know there will be people who think it's probably a natural phenomenon, perhaps to do with sunspots. But I tell you this, the planet's atmosphere is heating up. And even if we are not responsible, we have a duty to not make it any worse. And that is why we must do our best to create tourism and life that is as harm harmless as possible to the atmosphere. My key concern is aviation. And it's my key concern because I spend so much of my time on aeroplanes. I know it will be your concern because it is the heart of your industry. Thankfully, aviation emits only a very small percentage, tiny percentage, of overall greenhouse gases. And with new biofuel standards being announced this year, I can see a way for it becoming cleaner for the fact that I will have to plant fewer trees in the future to offset my own emissions. But that is one area that I would flag up to you of vital importance. We have to drive to keep aviation clean even as it continues to grow, which it will. The third key driver of the future, and it is linked to the second one, is the ongoing energy crisis. Now, there are several reasons we have a crisis in energy, but perhaps the most important one is the one of climate disease. We have to migrate from being a fossil fuel economy to become a sustainable fuel economy. And there is no one answer in all of this. There's no one magic bullet. We have to move to renewable forms of energy such as solar power, such as biomass, such as 
uh, wave power, wind power, geothermal power, but we cannot do it overnight. And we have to be careful that we don't wreck our economies as we are doing it. The job just became a lot harder because of what has happened in Japan at the Fukushima nuclear uh, power generating station. I was coming to the reluctant conclusion that nuclear power generation had an important part to play in electricity generation in the next 30 years. Because of what has happened in Japan, I very much doubt whether new nuclear building programs will now take place. They may, but I doubt it, especially in democracies. It may not be logical to equate the future safety of new nuclear power stations with the safety of designs that are 30 or 40 years old. But with electorates, we are not dealing with logic. We are dealing with sentiment. And voters react according to their sentiment. Therefore, it seems clear to me that we have an ongoing and lengthy crisis in energy development. Everybody in this room knows what is required. We have to move from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. We have to use the sun and the wind and the waves. Of course, this is going to take at least a generation to achieve, and my bet is that by the year 2030 or 2040, fossil fuels are still playing a major part in our energy supply but it has to be a reducing part and a reducing part and a reducing part. The fourth key driver of the next 20, 30 years has been a key driver of the last 20 years. And I stand in a city which has taken a central role in this. The fourth key driver of the future is globalization. Now, globalization is a word that in some audiences leads to smiles and nodding heads, and in other audiences leads to protests and complaints. My view of globalization, by which I mean free international trade and free international investment and development, is that when globalization is pursued ethically and sustainably, it is the greatest force for good we have. I believe that globalization in the 21st century has the potential to banish most world poverty. We have seen what has happened in the last 20 years with the rise of China, the rise of India, the rise of Malaysia, the rise of Brazil, the rise of other Latin American countries, the beginnings of development for several billion people. The Brookings Institute in the United States last month said that nearly three billion people have been lifted out of abject poverty by globalization. One and a half billion of those three billion are living in what we would call a comfortable position with enough food, somewhere to live, health care available, education available. And the other 1.5 are likely to get there in the next 10 years. What can be better than that? I feel like some young beauty contestant who might say to her interviewer, what I want to see is an end to world poverty. Globalization, done ethically and sustainably, can offer that in this century. An ethical and sustainable globalization means investment and development with respect for the people and respect for the host culture and pursued in a way which can be said to be truly sustainable. When you give a young man in a very poor country a job, 
and a career prospect, the young man will be unlikely to go home and start making bombs. You give a young man a prospect, a share in the future, we can begin to solve the world's problems. The fifth key driver of the future may at first seem to you rather strange. It's a personal thing. It's about the development in medical science. There are at least three major revolutions going on in medical science. The first is DNA profiling. Now, as you all know, the human genome was decoded in the year 2001, 10 years ago. And I stand before you as one of the few people on the planet who has had his own DNA completely decoded. What is the value of having your DNA decoded? Well, the first is I had my DNA decoded last year and I worked out that I was unlikely to be told that I would die as a very young man. So having got that satisfaction in hand, I nervously read on the website the results of my decoding. If we were on a cruise liner and you were all struck by the norovirus, you know that terrible bug that makes you sick, I could go to the sick room and work as an orderly because whatever happens, I cannot catch the norovirus. And if I suffer from a heart condition later this afternoon, if the doctor's in the room, please don't give me beta blockers because they won't work on me. They have no effect at all. I also know that I am likely, more likely than most people to get celiac disease. I am more likely than most people to get type 2 diabetes. However, the difference between my risk and other people's risk are very small. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. The real value of this is that in the future, if, I'm, if I am unwell, or if you are unwell, we can take drugs tailored to our own DNA. And all of a sudden, all of the existing therapies, let alone the new drugs that are coming down the pipeline, are made much more effective. Because at the moment, in medicine, it is one size fits all. And a dose of a drug for a 90-year-old woman who only weighs 110 pounds would be the same as a 30-year-old guy who's six foot six tall who weighs 300 pounds. It don't, makes no sense. But once you know someone's DNA, medicine can be tailored. And if I were to meet you here again in five years' time, I would bet you would all have your DNA profile. It's collapsing in price, and within the next two years, it will be available under most healthcare systems. The second revolution in medicine that's coming along, and you all know about this, are stem cell medicine. Using stem cells to regrow organs, hearts, lungs, livers, eyes, even skin, to regrow anew. And as a result of that, for people who are wealthy, it is possible to look 20 years ahead and say they can rejuvenate themselves should they want to. They can have backup organs grown, which they can implant. The third revolution in medicine is nanoscale medicine. Medicine at the smallest scale, which allows actual drugs to be targeted to reach their place easily. The result of all of this particular medical revolution is that most people in this room are going to live at least 20 years longer than your current highest estimate. How are your pension plans? People in this room under 30 years of age 
are likely to live to be at least 120. People under 50 are almost certain, on average, not in specific terms, to live to be 100 years old and in good health. This at a time when we have world population explosion. It doesn't seem right, does it? But yet for the rich people of the world, this is what medicine is about to offer. And for your industry, you'll understand that the geriatric component of tourism is going to go up and up and up. And I'm not talking now about parties of very unfit people. I'm talking about parties of quite elderly people who are quite fit. Now, the sixth key driver of the future is a wild card. It's the joker in the pack because it can change everything. And it is accelerating exponential technology development. Now, sometimes when I'm speaking at one of the posher, older universities, people will say, Ray, you don't need to use both of the words accelerating and exponential when you describe the path of development of technology because the words mean the same thing. And I say, actually, I do mean what I'm saying because the exponential rate of technology development is itself accelerating. You will all know that Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, the chip company, observed in the 1960s that the power and speed of microprocessors, or of processors as they were then, were doubling every two years. In the 1980s, he amended his observation and said it was down to doubling every 18 months. Somewhere around the year 2000, it was doubling every 12 months. Now we're doubling in power and speed every eight months. What does this mean? The first thing it means, and this is a real thing for you and for your customers, is that we are going to have the same amounts of technological development in the next eight years as we've had in the last 20 or 25 years. And if you think back 25 years, think of the late 1980s, what were your cell phones like then? How many bricks, you're right, sir. How many text messages did you send in the 1980s? How many emails did you send in the 1980s? How many flat screen televisions did you have in your home? And the same amount of development is going to happen again in the next eight years? 10 years? It will. Now, there is a very serious side to this. And I said at the outset of my talk that although I have been asked to talk about the next 60 years, I'm afraid I can only really speak about the next 30 years. And the reason I can do this, only do this, is as follows. Somewhere between the years 2035 and 2045, computers which are doubling in power, complexity, and speed will approach the capability of humans. I am choosing my words carefully. I'm not saying they'll be as clever as humans. They will approach the capability of humans. Most computer scientists suggest around 2040 is the most likely date when a computer becomes as capable as a human. The real issue is this. A year later, they'll be twice as capable. A year after that, four times as capable. A year after that, eight times as capable, then 16 times. You see what I mean about exponential. We futurists call this the technological singularity. And the reason we use this phrase, the technological singularity, is that rather like the singularity in a black hole in space where you can't see any information at all, 
So the point at which computers in their millions become more capable than humans is the point that we can't see beyond because we don't know what they will suggest to us. We don't know if we will be in control or if they will be in control. We have to face this issue before we get to the point of the singularity. But I said to you earlier, I wanted to suggest that because we have no language, we make an error in thinking of this as a cell phone or as a mobile phone. I have a confession to you. I am actually today a visitor from the year 2040. And I stand here before you with my constant companion called Maria. Maria lives just behind my right ear. Maria has been my companion ever since the year 2012. And we used to have those things, do you remember, we called them mobile phones. And Maria lived in my cell phone, and I would tell her what I wanted, and she would do it for me. In those days, she was quite dumb. But over the last 30 years, she's got smarter and smarter and smarter. And I know today that she's far smarter than I am, but she's too smart to let me know it. I called her Maria because my own wife's name is Maria, and if I were to speak in my sleep, I wouldn't want any misunderstandings to occur. Maria is in constant contact with the global brain. Do you remember we used to call it Google? And she tells me that I'm coming to the end of my time and it's about getting ready to wrap up this conference. But I said there were seven key drivers of the future. Seven. And I want to mention the final one because it will have an impact on you unless we all do something about it. It is the bottom 1.8 billion people on the planet. People who are taking no part in globalization. People in 58 nation states, most of them in Africa, but not all of them. Think of North Korea, think of Burma, think of Haiti. 1.8 billion people who are the dispossessed. We, through our governments and NGOs, must insist these people are brought into the fold. The future is truly bright for all of us, but it needs to be bright for all of us. Otherwise, we have repeats of Somalia with the pirates. That's what comes from the bottom 1.8 billion. I want to close by saying that when I was invited to this particular conference, I accepted with joy because I know that you are one of the strongest industries poised for very good growth for decades to come. I hope that is the conclusion you have reached during your conference, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I guess I can't do an imitation of the 2001 <laughs> computer. Anyhow, we would like to invite uh, Prada Interim CEO Bill Calderwood up to the stage to, uh, to offer a gift. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, how charming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, another one again. Yeah.